Hi, Sapphire Group. My name is Peka Thomas, and first of all, I want to thank you for letting me come and play in your sandbox. For the past couple of Sapphire meetings, you've seen me parked in front of this, and I know what some of you must be thinking. What the hell is that? Let me explain. This is the mighty Rebecca, and she's best described using a big, heaping helping of word salad. She is a Moog-style, analog, modular, voltage-controlled, monophonic, multi-timbral synthesizer. What? Let me unpack that for you. Starting with the term Moog style. Back in 1963, a young engineer from a small town in New York State named Robert A. Moog met avant-garde composer Herbert Deutsch at a trade fair and soon began discussing the idea of creating a, quote, portable electronic music studio, because up till then, electronic music was created either on humongous tube-driven behemoths or rooms chock-a-block with tape machines, tone generators, and DIY circuitry that couldn't make it onto a stage for live performance. Bob Moog, who already made a foray into building electronic musical instruments with his theremin kits, set about in his workshop in Trumansburg, New York, to tackle this issue. He got a $16,000 small business grant and started creating circuits utilizing the relatively new, commercially available transistors with exponential current outputs instead of vacuum tubes to greatly reduce the size of the instrument. They did basically the same tasks but were small, a bit less expensive, and generated far less heat than vacuum tubes. Of course, back in the early 60s, computer technology was in its nascent form, and digital circuitry for audio was a dream of the future. And that brings us to the next term, analog. Many of the circuits Bob designed were derived from pre-existing equipment, analytic tone generators, filters from radios and televisions, and amplification circuitry from telephony. Despite the development of digital audio in the ensuing years, analog synthesis still remains wildly popular to this day, as the nonlinear quantum quirkiness of electrons cascading through transistors, resistors, capacitors, op-amps, diodes, and the like, generates a quality of sound that, though difficult to define, huh? still tugs at the soul of many a synth geek. Rebecca is not an actual Moog synthesizer but rather a modern homage built to my specifications by Roger Eric and the people over at Synthesizers.com in Tyler, Texas. Moog modulars are prohibitively expensive and only owned or utilized by the gods of electronic music like Wendy Carlos, The Beatles, Keith Emerson, Tangerine Dream, this guy, and of course, lest we forget, The Monkees. Also, the Moog style modular isn't the only format out there. In fact, another format, the more modern Eurorack with its smaller footprint, is unquestionably the most popular in the modular world, with a gajillion modules out there made by a bazillion manufacturers. I've got nothing against Eurorack. In fact, Rebecca has a number of the smaller Eurorack modules in her setup. It's just I'm partial to the synth of my generation. Plus, I find the knobs and the switches on your rack tiny and fiddly for my sausage fingers. In the process of designing and building his new creation, Bob created a handful of conventions that are still utilized today in modern analog synths. Probably the most profound is what is known as voltage control, the application of external voltage to change the parameters of a given circuit. Control voltage comes in two flavors bipolar and unipolar. Bipolar, with a voltage swing of 10 volts, plus 5 to minus 5, is used to alter pitch and to modulate parameters like pitch, which produces vibrato, amplitude, which gives you tremolo, and filter frequency cutoff. Think wah Probably the most important contribution Bob made to analog synthesis was his volt to octave convention. He designed his oscillators that's the tone generating circuit of his instrument, to respond in such a way that for every volt either added to or subtracted from the input, the pitch would either go up an octave or down an octave respectively. 
This means that every successive one twelfth or point oh eight three 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 of a volt produces a western scale semitone. Uh, Bob played the piano and incorporated a voltage-generating piano-type keyboard in his design, though the synth was not bound to the western scale. The 10-volt swing gave you 10 octaves, a gigantic range of pitch. Unipolar, on the other hand, acts like a switch in an analog synth. Its state is either low, at 0 volts, or high, at 5 volts, positive or negative, and is most frequently produced as a pulse wave with no slewing of the voltage from one state to another. The switching voltage can be utilized a number of ways, as gate or trigger signals to activate circuits. Think of a key on the keyboard. When it is not pressed, the gate signal is low and no sound is heard. Press it, and the gate goes high, producing the pitch. Hold it as long as you wish, and the gate stays high, and your pitch continues. Let the key go, and the gate goes low again, turning off the sound. A trigger is like a gate, only it stays on for a prescribed length of time. Triggers will produce start and stop signals for certain circuits we'll be discussing later. Another essential application of the unipolar signal is a clock, where a chain of triggers is sent to circuits looking for tempo information like sequencers, which we'll cover soon. And finally, Dr. Moe created something for all of us suffering from a bit of OCD and anal retentiveness. The... Uh, Mog unit, a panel convention, 5U, that's 8.75 inches tall, and 8 rack spaces, 2.125 inches wide. This allows for nice, neat-looking configurations of modules, which is our next term to explore. Bob designed his instrument as a modular system, meaning that each of his circuit designs were self-contained and not electronically connected to one another. Connections between modules were made with quarter-inch tip-sleeve cables. Think of a bunch of guitar cables at varying lengths. This convention allowed for sonic experimentation, which is still popular today. For gate and trigger signals, he used a Cinch Jones connector. All analog voltage-controlled modular synths are, despite the size and power, monophonic, producing only one note at a time, like a clarinet or a trumpet. However, monophonic never stopped a woodwind or a brass section in an orchestra from making a mighty sound when all instruments involved are playing together. That's why I had Rebecca designed the way she is. Instead of one or two monophonic voices, she has ten. She is, if you will, a synth orchestra. With all the modules I need to create ten powerful, fully realized sounds, I can make complete compositions without having to repatch or overdub. Just hit play and go. She is a monophonic, multi-timbral beast. To realize this dream, I've equipped Rebecca with 31 oscillators and 21 filters, featuring 12 unique filter designs, many of them recreations of classic filters from legendary synths, and each with its own distinct personality. There are also 16 envelope generators, 10 mixers, and 10 VCAs. Well, that's a deep dive into Rebecca's definition. Let's take a look at some of her basic modules and patch together a simple sound. First and foremost, let's examine the voltage-controlled oscillator, the source of the raw waveform from which we will sculpt our sound. Derived from the laboratory test tone generator, Bob added his control voltage concept to not only remotely control the pitch output by the aforementioned one volt per octave convention, but also modulate the pitch of one oscillator with another that would result in everything from mild vibrato to outrageous high-frequency FM squeals. If the VCO is set to output signals below the audible range for modulation applications, it is known as a low-frequency oscillator, or LFO. The voltage-controlled oscillator, or VCO, outputs various waveforms, each with their own harmonic signature. Sine, triangle, sawtooth, ramp, and variable pulse, the width of which can be modulated by a control voltage. Initial octave can be chosen using a selector switch that defines the octaves in feet 32, 16, 8, 4, and 2, a cool callback to the original synth. 
the pipe organ and its pipe lengths. This convention is still used today in modern sense. A non-voltage-controlled vernier knob exists to fine-tune the oscillator. In many synth patches, two or more VCOs are used, tuned to different octaves or intervals, or slightly detuned at the same octave to create fatter sounds. In these applications, the output of multiple VCOs are patched into a mixer module. From there, the signal goes to a voltage-controlled filter, or VCF. If the VCO is the heart of the sound, the VCF is the soul. And it's where Moog's design concept gets his name, subtractive synthesis. The filter removes some of the harmonics present in the waveform it is receiving and shapes the color of your sound design. There are four basic filter types, low pass, high pass, band pass, and notch. Any of you with knowledge of a mixing console are familiar with these terms as they are components of an EQ circuit. Bob Moog is famous for his low pass filter design lovingly dubbed Bob's Ladder. It is a four pole 24 dB per octave filter with four cascading transistor circuits, each rolling off harmonics at the chosen cutoff point by 6 dB per octave. He also added a resonance control that boosts the signal at the cutoff frequency that adds a personality to the signal that has become de rigueur in the synth sound design as it adds a vocal-like quality to the sound. The filter output in this basic patch then goes to the voltage-controlled amplifier module, or VCA. Amplifier is a misnomer. It's actually an attenuator. Not unlike the other voltage-controlled modules we have seen, the VCA can be affected remotely. Modulation from an oscillator will give you tremolo, but the most used modulation device is the envelope generator, or EG. The EG, when triggered by a gate signal, will alter the amount of voltage sent over time in stages. In a typical EG, also known as an ADSR, stage one is the attack which varies the time between the onset of the gate signal to when it reaches its maximum voltage. Stage two of an ADSR is decay, the time it takes to drop to the stage three level known as sustain. Stage four releases the time it takes once the gate signal goes low for the voltage to return to zero. The application of the EG will greatly affect the shape of the sound. Using short attack, decay, and release settings and a low sustain setting, plucky percussive sounds can be attained. Conversely, longer times and higher sustain sounds will offer up legato pad-like sounds. And of course, there's everything in between. Finally, how do we get this patch to play? Well, there are a number of controllers you can use, including wheels, ribbons, blocks, joysticks, and even whammy bars. But the most used controllers on a Moog-style modular synth are the piano-style keyboard and the sequencer. In an authentic Moog modular, the keyboard sends pitch and gate voltages to the modules. On Rebecca's more modern design, the keyboards send MIDI data to specialized modules that convert the MIDI data into the correct pitch and gate voltage for the instrument. The MIDI zoned keyboards and the modules allow me to send up to eight separate pitch and gate signals, a must for Rebecca's multi timbral tasks. At long last, the sequencer, probably my favorite and definitely the largest, most knob laden module in the bunch. Unlike most modules in an analog modular synth that feed on voltage, the sequencer serves it up. In the case of the legendary Moog 960 sequencer, the voltage is parsed out in eight stages that move from one stage to the next based on the speed of either its own internal oscillator or an external clock source. Each stage has a knob that adjusts the stage's voltage output. The stages are summed to an output jack, and that output can be multiplied by one, two, or four times its original reading. And a sequence of voltages can be sent to a destination, most commonly the VCO, but it can be quite interesting when sent to the filter. There are three rows, so you can route one row to the VCO, another to the filter, and the third to goodness knows where. Or using another module designed specifically for this purpose, known as the 962 sequential switch, you can sequence the sequencer, having each of the rows follow the preceding one, expanding the length of your sequence from 8 to 16 or 24. 
Well, I think I better end this presentation now, or we'll be here all night. I can talk about since at the drop of the hat, and I'll lend you the hat. But if you're at all interested, I'd be more than happy to do a further presentation of this sometime in the near future. In the meantime, I'd like to leave you with a piece of music that Rebecca and I created a while back. It includes 10 tracks, all recorded simultaneously, all at the same time. Thank you so much for letting me be a part of the Sapphire Group. And now, here's East Eats West.